Hello one and all and welcome to Behind the Glass, the podcast which aims to take you behind the scenes of the YouTube channel Seen Through Glass as well as the automotive and social media worlds. I am your host Sam from the YouTube channel Seen Through Glass and this week I'm afraid there is no Vicky. However, later in the episode I am going to be having my first external guest or let's say phone call guest because I'm going to be speaking to LMP1 Le Mans driver Ollie Webb. I feel like that's a that's a bad introduction for him. I'm underselling him a little bit and I'll get into it a little bit. My microphone just fell over. Uh, sorry, hold on a second. Uh, for those of you who aren't joining me on YouTube, those who are listening audio only, uh, you might not be able to tell that I'm in one of the Drive the World hotels, currently actually in Ingolstadt. Uh, and the hotel which I'm in, I'm in right now this evening isn't necessarily set up for podcasting. So I'm trying my best, but my microphone just slightly gave in. So sorry if you heard a large whack and thud there. But uh, yes, it's quite a rudimental setup. And for those camera nerds out there, I've also just been inspecting my GH5 because I'm sitting right up close to it. And yeah, if you don't know, I use a Panasonic GH5 for the majority of my YouTube videos and sitting this close I'm starting to realize how absolutely battered it has become during Drive the World. It is sort of pits of it are peeling off and there seem to be scratches and marks. I never like this. I never like getting that close to things. Have you ever done it with a car? Those of you listening. Uh, one thing that always frustrates me about going to Dub Customs or Yanomize or any place that sort of does detailing or PPF is they really inspect the car with sort of hawk eye vision and just pick up on things that you would never notice in normal day life. And it just makes, yeah, it quite a depressing experience. Um, so that's what's going on right now with my camera. But anyway, here we go. As I say, episode five, I think. I'm starting to lose track, which I guess is a good sign. Um, but episode five, I'm going to claim of season two of Behind the Glass. i determined to make season two a weekly podcast. Uh, and so far, we're going strong. I think we've now been going longer than a month. But I don't want to get ahead of myself uh, based on the sporadicness of season one. Um, I'm never quite sure how long this is going to last, but we're, we're doing all right so far. Uh, apologies for those of you that have become a fan of Vicky, uh, my girlfriend and producer, and the role that she plays on this podcast. Uh, but she wasn't always going to feature in every single episode. And something I personally want to introduce, or, or maybe bring back, I suppose, to Behind the Glass, is the interview style format. Uh, and because we're traveling so much this year and constantly in different locations, it's quite hard to sit down with people, to arrange and schedule sit-down interviews. So I suddenly thought, how about calling up people, uh, whether that's sort of, you know, FaceTime or Skype, so that I can actually bring you YouTube viewers uh, visual content. Uh, but if not, just literally, you know, calling them. And it, it opens up the possibilities of who I can speak to uh, during these actual podcast episodes. So as I mentioned, Ollie Webb is going to be my guest a little bit later on. Uh, not only do we speak to him about his preparation for Le Mans this weekend, but of course we're going to touch on what is the main topic of today's episode, the uh, catastrophe, I'm going to say, between uh, what took place at the Canadian Formula One Grand Prix. I was going to say between Lewis Hamilton and Sebastian Vettel, but I actually think it's between the sport and the stewards, uh, but we'll, we'll save that. We're going to get onto it a little bit later. Uh, just to recap what else is going to be discussed in this episode before we get started, uh, I'm also going to be discussing the new Pirelli partnership for Drive the World, some activity I've been doing with Shell recently, well, I did recently. Um, I actually popped back to the UK during Drive the World for literally, I think, 24, maybe 36 hours at a push. Uh, so I want to talk about that whole experience briefly. Um, also, I want to talk about the BMW M2 competition, which I drove during that show activity. Uh, the fact that I took my 911 Carrera T onto the Nürburgring this weekend. Yes. No, I don't think I've posted about that anywhere yet. There's definitely no video yet. So you guys are going to get a bit of an exclusive for my experience uh, driving for the very first time on the Nürburgring and doing it in the Carrera T. Uh, and then we'll be coming on to the Canadian Grand Prix. I want to talk a little bit myself
itself uh, about the whole sort of situation with Vettel and Hamilton and the stewards and the penalty before bringing Ollie in. So that's a little bit of a preview. If you're watching here on YouTube, hello, uh, here we are. As I say, you join me in my hotel room in Ingolstadt. Make sure you subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss future episodes. And of course, give this podcast a thumbs up if you're enjoying it. If you're listening, wherever you're listening, I would really be grateful uh, if you would give this podcast a five-star review, mainly on iTunes. I, I think a lot of you are listening uh, via sort of iTunes podcast, but wherever you are, if you get the chance to give me a five-star rating, that will help spread the word about Behind the Glass, because I love the little community we've got listening at the moment. Uh, I feel like you guys are the, the, the ones that I relate to the most. Uh, we're a little club, we're a little gang. I get to share things with you that maybe I don't share with the others. Uh, however, we do want to open it up and increase the listenership. Uh, and, and, you know, just spread, spread the love. I've gone all hippie there. I don't really know why. Uh, but anyway, here we go. Episode five of Behind the Glass. And let's roll. So this week, I was very excited to announce that Pirelli have come on board as the official tyre partner of Drive the World, which is fantastic. Uh, I would always plan to try and bring on more partners and sponsors throughout the year. Uh, as we've discussed quite a few times on this podcast, Drive the World is not cheap uh, and it is not easy and I need a lot of help and support. And some of you listening may have already contributed quite a lot towards this trip and ooh, got a WhatsApp apparently. Oh, I'm going to just mute my laptop for a second. So if you heard that, um, don't know who's messaging me so late. I'm recording this podcast at 10 p.m. at night, so yeah, someone could, uh, I don't know, obviously not sleep. Uh, where was I? I totally lost my train of thought. Ah, yes, Pirelli. Um, this trip is always going to be uh, a challenge, uh, financially, logistically, and so as much support as I can get from as many ways as possible is always welcome. Uh, and as I mentioned, a few of you got involved uh, way back in the day with the Kickstarter, and that was kind of the, the first uh, load of money which helped sort of start fund, start to fund the trip. It allowed me to book hotels and flights and get the ball rolling. Uh, and whilst uh, we're amazingly still tapping into that pot, but also other partners and sponsors, whether that's funding or services they're providing, uh, always looking for more people to join in. And so having Pirelli come aboard is fantastic because it goes without saying uh, what they're going to provide in terms of tyres is A+. Uh, the Carrera T, as I mentioned when I announced the partnership, was fitted with P0 tyres from factory. And so, of course, you can go out and you can experiment with different tyres on your cars. Um, I don't want to pretend like that's a, a thing that you shouldn't be doing. However, I quite like just keeping it with factory. And if uh, they fitted them with P0 there, that's got to be done for a reason. Uh, and so whenever I'm replacing tyres, uh, I just think it's better and easier to stick with whatever was fitted at factory. Also... Heaven forbid you get a nail in the tyre or a puncture for some reason. If you've sort of fitted a different manufacturer or a different make, it then starts to get a bit complicated with replacement tyres. I think it's just easier to keep it all in the family. So that is brilliant. Um, they're going to be on sort of hand and on support for, for tyre replacement, for, for extra or fresh rubber. And lots of you were calling for sort of burnouts or donuts to sort of celebrate this partnership and burn up my old tyres. I really should have done that, but kind of didn't really think about it um, at the time so maybe for round two whenever these uh, these current set of tires start to fade maybe I'll do a bit of a yeah burnout donut action uh, maybe I'll upload that after Pirelli <laughs> come to help with a fresh set of tires um, so anyway that's the sort of basics but of course uh, they're an incredible brand incredible company that do lots of different things um, but from my side one of the most interesting things they do is supply tires for Formula One so of course there's going to be a, a number of sort of activations or content creating opportunities by the way i've been wondering this for a while do you all know what we mean when we say content is that a really am i sort of talking down to you a little bit there but i'm aware that a lot of youtubers and especially within the automotive space use a lot of sort of video making terms that i'm not sure everyone understands for example content b-roll embargoes i really hate it when journalists and us youtubers say the word embargo because it's a real in-house press term back in my pr days used to say embargo a lot and 
somehow that sort of crept out into the social media sphere. And I'm not sure everyone understands what a press embargo is. It usually comes up after, you know, we go and drive a new McLaren or a new Renault or whatever it might be. And then people will post pictures on Instagram and saying, oh, I can't talk about it yet because I'm under embargo. And I'm always like, why are you saying that? Just say you're not allowed to talk about it until this certain date. Uh, so content, I feel like I use the word content a lot. And I should be saying videos or photos, um, but that's essentially what content is. And I know majority of you will know that. And I hope I don't want to be teaching you how to suck eggs. I think that's the expression. But uh, I hate I hate yeah using these kind of industry kind of words sometimes uh, and. I'm worrying that maybe some of you might not know what I'm talking about. But anyway, uh, Pirelli's links with F1 should provide plenty of ways and opportunities for me to make videos and photos uh, throughout the year, but specifically a little bit later on uh, in the year. We're working on some plans for sort of the second half of the season of F1, most definitely. Um, but lots to come with them, and I'm really excited to have them on board. So big thumbs up there. I've also literally just put live today a video that I made with Shell a couple of weeks ago when I had to fly back to the UK for 24, 36 hours maybe at a push. It was whilst I was in Bulgaria, or whilst we were based in Bulgaria, and Shell were doing a sort of European-wide campaign where they were having an M2 competition kind of modified or, or made over. It was called the Shell Helix Makeover uh, by various sort of YouTubers or influencers at, at different stops or diff in different countries, and I was representing the UK. Now, I have to say, I think I kind of got the short stick slightly because my modification, if you could call it that, was to change the oil of the car which was a fundamental part of the campaign because it was all around Shell Helix oils. Uh, but it wasn't necessarily the sort of most... Uh exciting is the wrong word, but sort of, you know, visually engaging. No, I'm not really sure. Basically, I wanted to put like tires on it or wrap it or put wheels on it or an exhaust because I guess I'm more used to that. And uh, I was excited by the idea of doing that. Uh, but I got handed down this challenge to change the oil, uh, something I've never done on a car before. I'm not really that ashamed or embarrassed to admit it. I want to be open and honest with you guys. Uh, it's embarrassing, I guess. Uh, or maybe, I don't know if it's embarrassing. How many of you have changed the oil on a car before? For. Maybe you're all going to come back and say, we all have. Uh, maybe it's a very car guy thing to do, but I just haven't. Um, you know, my cars that I've owned have had services, have never really needed an oil change. Sure, they've needed oil top-ups, but not an actual oil change unless it is part of the sort of, you know, annual service plan. So I've never had the need to. Uh, and so just have never done it. And so I don't know if that's a really awful thing to be admitting, maybe something I should be hiding, but I admitted it anyway, uh, and took the M2 competition to a, a garage in London uh, where they very kindly uh, demonstrated how an oil change can take place. Um, but it was a cool, it was a really fun project, a really cool, different way of filming something. Uh, I tried to sort of throw as much creativity at it as possible. Um, and I liked the concept of sort of YouTubers passing along the baton of this M2 to competition and I have to say what a cool car my first time driving an M2 competition I took it down to the New Forest which is kind of south England uh, stunning stunning area amazing driving roads quite a few different automotive outlets uh, use those roads for filming they always have like wild horses wild wild horses uh, that was my Rolling Stones impression uh, roaming around it's just it's just great for filming and photography uh, and the car was awesome Really, really like that car. It's another BMW which I've enjoyed, which yeah, this year is happening far too often, uh, me and BMWs. Uh, it's a very much a romantic story, isn't it? Um, but yeah, really cool project. I uh, really enjoyed doing it. I hope you guys did too. And of course, as I kind of mentioned with Pirelli, throughout this year, working with partners and sponsors and just other different sort of companies and activations, just help uh, with the overall planning and logistics and funding of this trip. Shell, I've been really lucky now, I'm going to touch wood, to have worked with for three years, I think. And every year they come back and we, we look at different ways of activating and different projects to do. And I'm so hashtag blessed, uh, to quote Lewis Hamilton, to be able to work with a company like that. Uh, and yeah, brilliant to have sort of kickstarted the year with a fun European wide campaign. Let's see what else we might be able to get up to. Just gonna have a quick drink of water, bear with me. Now, oh, <laughs> 
Not quite sure what happened there. That was embarrassing. Moving on. Um, no, aside from, yeah, a couple of recent videos, I want to talk about a video which hasn't come out yet, uh, which was my experience doing my first ever lap, driving my first ever lap on the Nürburgring. Because I have experienced the ring before from the passenger seat. That was, that was going to be a tongue twister. The passion... Passenger seat of Schmi 150's GT3. How fast can I say that? The passenger seat of Schmi 150's G GT3. Not fast. That's hard. That's a tongue twister. Give that a go. I'll tell you what, this is what I want for the next episode of Behind the Glass. If you have the courage to, record yourself saying at speed, the passenger seat of Schmi 150's GT3. Just a voice note or a video. Uh, and Insta DM it. Or email it to me at drivetheworld at seenthroughglass.com and I'll, pay out, I'll play some of the funniest ones in next week's episode because I think that's the passenger seat of Schmi 150's GT3. Well, anyway, that was my, my first and only experience on the ring until this week uh, because I was in Frankfurt, based in Frankfurt, and thought I had to go over to the ring. And despite some potentially dodgy weather, uh, I still drove on over and was really lucky because it was a very quiet day at the ring in terms of other people driving. Uh, and the weather just about held off. It was very overcast, but not wet because I think I would have been a bit terrified to go out for the very first time behind the wheel of a car on the ring in the wet um so i linked up with uh, uh misha and the apex guys if you don't know uh misha is sort of king of the the ring on the internet uh plenty more to come of him and with him in the main seen through glass youtube video um and apex are one of the sort of uh, ring experience companies you can go along and you can drive cars or you can be in a passenger in cars they instruct they do loads of different stuff and they actually threw me in the passenger seat of their 600LT McLaren before I went out myself. And my good Lord, was that an experience. Um, I, I'd forgotten how good that car was. Uh, I remember falling in love with that car during the press drive in at the Hungara Ring, but I'd forgotten just how incredible it is on track. And it was with the professional driver who... Well, he didn't hold back. Let's just say he did not hold back. I'm a bit frustrated because they told me over and over again that they had cameras in the car all set up. I didn't need to take anything in with me. Um, and now I've just received the footage and it's 720p, which means it's low resolution. So I'm not quite sure how to use that. Um, I still want to chop out some bits and use it in the main video, but yeah, it's not ideal. But these things happen. The main focus, the main thing that I was there to do was to drive a lap of the ring myself and to do it in the Carrera T with roof box and rally lights. Yes, I had so much stuff in the car. I've just received some photos as well, some still photos, which I'll definitely be posting on Instagram soon of the car um, on the ring. And I think it looks absolutely mega. I have to say, terrifying experience. Absolutely terrifying experience because... I had Misha, who used to go by Boosted Boris. Some of you might know him as Boosted Boris. Uh, sat in the passenger seat, or sitting in the passenger seat. Sorry, Vicky would have corrected me there. Corrected myself. I'm learning. I think that's good. Anyway, he was sitting in the passenger seat, uh, barking instructions at me, or barking advice at me, and doing it in such a quick and robotic manner, because I'm sure he's done a million laps around that place. I just couldn't take the information in. It's all happening so quickly and you're trying to concentrate so hard on everything that's happening. Then trying to compute somebody beside you going, okay, break up the left-hand marker, turn to the right, aim to the left, look at that tree, under the bridge, you're going to turn to the right. I mean, it's how rally drivers do it, not a clue. Uh, super intense, but I can't wait to share that video. I've actually been a bit nervous to look back at the footage because it was such an amazing experience. I really hope the video does it justice. I'm sure it'll be good, but... Anyway, I'm going to try and get into editing that in the next couple of days. So stay tuned. Make sure you go over, subscribe, youtube.com forward slash seen through glass. Okay, those little subjects and topics out of the way. It's time to come on to the big juicy bit, I suppose. Um, because Formula One 2019 finally delivered, um, but maybe not in the way that we were all hoping. It's been a sort of a season of 
uh, what could have been or maybe false hope. Uh, let's go back to testing when, you know, everyone was saying Ferrari were a second quicker than Mercedes and everyone else and, oh, Mercedes had lost it and, you know, this is going to be Vettel's year or maybe Leclerc was going to win the championship. And then we got to Australia and Mercedes just absolutely dominated everyone. Uh, and it's kind of continued on that sort of uh, form for the rest of the season. We had, was it five? five Mercedes one twos in a row um, and Monaco I would argue was a relatively exciting race I do think there's a bit of this sort of misplaced hype around well Danny Rick's drive last year with his engine problem and then Lewis's drive on the dodgy tyres let's face it if they were on any other track uh, they would have lost the lead within a couple of laps and Max Verstappen of all people if he couldn't get past at Monaco, I don't think anyone could have. Do you know what I mean? And I'm not saying that's because Lewis's defending was amazing. I think it's just genuine because that track, unfortunately, just doesn't work for modern day F1 cars. Um, that's actually probably a separate podcast and something I'll look to do at some point this year is, you know, F1 and their circuits and which circuits need to remain on the calendar and which are now outdated and which are too new and boring anyway as i say another another topic uh let's come on to canada that was what i was supposed to be talking about wasn't it so what happens when i haven't got my producer here to keep me on track um so yes canada uh, a grand prix which i usually really enjoy i love playing that circuit on the playstation if that counts but i have lots of fond memories of like amazing grand prix there I'm sure there have been a number of dull ones, but you kind of forget those quite quickly, don't you? Um, and so lots of amazing races stick out in my memory. Uh, and the grid, let's just talk about the grid. Qualifying delivered what was potentially a really exciting grid. I'm going to get on the Danny Ricardo fan club for a second, or the fan train, or the hype train. P4 in a Renault, yes, some people messed up. There were some people missing doesn't really matter. Uh, That was an incredible result, I thought, and maybe suggests that he's starting to get on the one lap pace of the Renault. I would argue that his race pace is still a little bit off. Uh, We saw Hülkenberg really coming back at him throughout the majority of the race, and I got the feeling that Renault cooled off their sort of potential um, fight, on-track fight, towards the end of the race because it was the first time Renault were going to be able to salvage a double points finish. And I think they probably just said, guys, hold it there. If they hadn't have done that, I reckon Hülkenberg would have taken Ricardo. So he's still got some work to do, I guess, until he finds his sort of real pace again and... You know, you're speaking to any drivers, they always say it takes half a season, if not a full season, to really acclimatise yourself with a team and a car. So I don't think we're going to see the best of Danny Ricciardo and Renault until at least next year. But hopefully throughout the year, some more results like that P4 uh, continue. But uh, we had Vettel on pole, first time in something like 17 Grand Prix, but also great to see Ferrari really competitive again. Uh, Lewis looked kind of up for the challenge. Leclerc was there having a bit of a quiet weekend, it has to be said. Um, but you never knew what to expect. And there was just, you know, Max Verstappen, where was he? I think he started in the end eighth, but had qualified in 10th or 11th. Um, So he was out of position. You knew he was going to be coming back strong. And then Bottas as well, just being Bottas and (laughs) having a bit of a fail. Um, So, yeah, it was set up for a perfect Grand Prix, a perfect Canadian Grand Prix. And I will say that 75% of the race if not 90% of the race, was incredibly dull. Um, really, just nothing nothing really happened, did it? There was just not a lot going on. Uh, a bit of overtaking in the lower midfield, um, but up at the front, Vettel, Hamilton, Clerk just kind of raced away with it, with just keeping two, three seconds apart, no big action. Um, kind of felt like Lewis was just holding back, ready to lunge at some point, but you didn't know if it was going to come. Uh, And yeah, anyway, basically I thought it was a boring race. And then after the pit stops, Hamilton starts really reeling in Vettel. And I actually felt a bit disheartened. I felt happy and excited that Lewis might potentially win. But I was like, oh my God, where is he getting this pace from? And then when he kind of got to Vettel and wasn't literally just looking to pass him with DRS after the first lap, I thought, okay, hold on a sec, we might actually have a race on here. And there was about... Three or four laps where it looked like we were going to have, finally, Vettel versus Hamilton in a really competitive way. The two were going to have a chance to go at it on track, that maybe they'll be jostling and dueling for five or ten laps. Uh, There was only about 20 laps left of the race, but it, it felt genuinely exciting. Vettel, once again, 
cracked under the pressure, didn't he? I mean, this, I think, has been skipped and not talked about enough. But once again, in a pressurised situation, Vettel has made a mistake and he went off the track. Um, now, who, kn- who knows if the car, there was an issue with the car. Uh, haven't researched it enough. But from just watching on the TV, it looked like once again he'd cracked under pressure. So he goes off the track, rejoins, and as he's rejoining, really squeezes any gap that is there for Lewis to get past. Now, arguably, if it was a wider track, uh, if there wasn't a wall there, Lewis probably would have taken to even the grass and probably got past. So such was the speed difference between Hamilton and Vettel. But this is fundamentally a street track in Montreal, and there was a wall. So Lewis had to get out of it, slam on the brakes, and Vettel kept the position. Now, when I was watching, I will admit I reacted like, Ooh! (laughs) <laughs> I definitely had an animated reaction. It was definitely a, an exciting moment. And I'm like, whoa, that was so close. That was so tight. Not for one second did I think, oh, my God, Vettel's cheated. Oh, Vettel tried to crash into him. Oh, my God, like he needs to get a penalty. I was like, let's just keep going. This is amazing. Let's hope this keeps happening over and over again. Let's go back to Lewis Hamilton versus Nico Rosberg, uh, Bahrain, 2014, some of the most epic dueling and jostling on track ever. There was definitely some quite punchy moves and pushing to the side and maybe, I don't know, just questionable tactics. And we even saw in the Canadian Grand Prix, Danny Rick using slightly questionable tactics in how he was defending from Uh, Verstappen or Bottas? Bottas. Bottas, I think. However, for some reason, Lewis jumps on the radio. Not for some reason. I think, understandably, Lewis jumps on the radio, complains. Let's get the stewards to look at this. I kind of get maybe why he did that, but I also think a little bit like, oh, Lewis, mate, just get on with it. Do you really need to complain? Was it really that bad? Uh, And then, of course, now, I guess, infamously, uh, Vettel gets handed this five-second penalty, uh, which ends up losing him the race. Now... My opinion, just to get this out here before we speak to Ollie, because I'm going to bring uh, my interview with Ollie in very shortly, uh, but my opinion was nothing happened. This is my biggest issue with the whole situation because, yes, I'm a huge Hamilton fan. I do want him to win the championship and I do prefer him on track to Vettel. But he, okay, he had to get on the brakes tough luck mate it's racing he didn't get any damage he didn't go into the wall he wasn't made to retire he didn't get a puncture no one else was affected at all Hamilton maybe lost half a second if that to Vettel Vettel remained intact no damage no one was hurt no one was injured it was just such a nothing event but for some reason they handed out this five second penalty and And we always bang on, I think, about fairness in F1. The stewards have to be fair and issue penalties in a completely fair and normal way so that everyone knows where the line is. But this made no sense to me. And it ruined the way the race ruined the race, in my opinion, because suddenly it just didn't matter. Hamilton was quick enough that he was never going to drop five seconds behind. There was no need for him to overtake Vettel. Vettel was deflated. So uh, it was just like this complete like, oh, well. What was the point of that? Now we're just sitting here going, and I hate it when when someone finishes ahead on track, but then because of penalties or whatever, the result isn't the same at the end of the race, if that makes sense. So Vettel finished in, the f- in first position, crossed the line first, but doesn't get to take first place on the podium. Um, I just think it was an awful moment for Formula 1 as a sport at a time when Liberty are trying to reinvent the sport and engage an audience and get people on board. This was just like, just left a sour taste in my mouth. What is worse was Charles Leclerc, who was catching at a rapid rate of knots uh, and could have taken second place from Vettel, apparently wasn't even told by Ferrari about Vettel's penalty, (laughs) which is just, I mean, in the air of sort of, you know, lack of competitiveness or uh, competitive spirit, I understand Ferrari protecting Vettel, but I mean, that was the only excitement we had as towards the end of the race was watching Leclerc's lap time and seeing if he was going to be able to jump Vettel. Uh, We then had the absolute 
absolute Hollywood drama that was Vettel going off and running away to the Ferrari motorhome, kind of slightly refusing to go to the podium, but then being forced to switching the first and second uh, position boards uh, and then just absolutely sulking and, and, you know, venting, I think, uh, understandably, in the room of awkwardness uh, before the podium and on the podium and in the interviews. So anyway, look, I just wanted to share my two cents. Uh, As a Hamilton fan, I do think it was super unjust. I think Hamilton shouldn't have complained. I think he shouldn't have jumped on the radio and asked for the stewards to look at it. Um, And what you're going to hear in a second is Oli Webb actually revealing a really interesting sort of little anecdote, which not all of you might have picked up on and hasn't been heavily reported, but kind of shows some of the mentality, I think, of Vettel, but also of Hamilton, because... A lot of respect between the two drivers and a lot has been said about, you know, how gentlemanly and uh, good natured Hamilton was with the whole situation. But I disagree slightly. And as I say, calling the stewards to look at the incident in the first place, I think questionable. Wow, bit of a monologue there. Um, uh, I want to now bring in my guest, Mr. Ollie Webb. Now, most of you, well, most of my listeners might know him from Instagram, actually. He's super active on Instagram, Uh, has amazing photos uh, taken of him, but also he takes, uh, posted to his account uh, endlessly. He's just got engaged. So he's just got engaged to his girlfriend, Nyla, who is another sort of very active person on Instagram. Uh, If you want to have... If you want to be jealous of a couple, uh, or if you want couple goals, go check out these two, because it is amazing the life they live. They travel everywhere. They're incredibly good looking. They're very in shape. He drives cars. She jumps out of planes. Uh, it's just a very enviable life, or so it seems, uh, from the outside. So I kickstart my interview by, of course, first congratulating him on that, before getting into the details of his preparations for Le Mans, because he is driving in LMP1, the Supremo class uh, at Le Mans 24 hour. Uh, or at least, I guess, the number one class, because arguably GT racing can sometimes be a bit more entertaining, Um, and then asking for his opinion on the whole Canadian Grand Prix situation. Um, I recorded this in the Apex Garage garage, uh, at the Nürburgring, so it's quite noisy and echoey. At times you can hear them washing cars outside and moving cars in and out, so I apologise. Also, their Wi-Fi wasn't that strong, Uh, so the connection does drop out here and there, um, and obviously the recording isn't done with proper microphones. So let me know what you think. Uh, It's the first kind of these sort of, you know, phone-in interviews, I suppose. Definitely want to do more, but want to perfect how I'm recording them and sort of producing them. Uh, So let me know your thoughts, but I hope you find it insightful. As I say, make sure you keep your ears open for a little anecdote, a little bit of information that some of you might have already picked up on, but Ollie and his sort of network of drivers have noted from Vettel and Hamilton's interaction uh, at the Canadian Grand Prix and uh, yeah not much else for me to say now apart from to roll my chat with Ollie Webb Congratulations I mean that's where we have to start right Thanks very much You have a fiance A fiance we spent about a week trying to figure out if it's two E's or one E (laughs) But, I mean, uh, you had to go all out, and it looks like on Instagram you did go all out. How long did you take preparing that actual proposal? Um, It was a good five months in the making. It was quite a while of planning. and We're we're lucky that we get to go to quite a few amazing places, but that's where she was was raised, and it's... um, uh, it's kind of like a, an unlikely place for it to do it. So for that reason, I thought it'd be a cool place to do it. Super cool. Well, mega congrats. Um, and tell me, so where, where are you right now? Are you in Le Mans or near Le Mans? I am in Le Mans. It's been raining all day, but the sun has just come out. Finally. Amazing. But um, I'm in Le Mans, yeah. So uh, we've just done scrutineering in the town and then uh, we're on track in uh, on Wednesday morning. Wow. Are you feeling ready? Are you feeling prepared? Yeah. Looking forward to it. The car's much more reliable than it's been. It's, we're losing a little bit in top speed, but the, but the car is, is reliable for, for the long run, which is what we want. This is perfect, because you haven't had the best of luck in recent Le Mans 24 hours. No, not in the last. We kind of started on a high of a couple of podiums in my first two goes at it, and then, yeah, we've not, we've not finished the last two years, so it's been a bit miserable. As a driver, is it? did, did you feel like a build-up? Did, does it feel special? Or is it just another race? No, it feel yeah, it feels different. It feels like a build up to a whole season's worth of driving in which it is. I mean Le Mans twenty four hour is, is a Formula One season and more in one race in terms of the amount of distance we cover. So it's uh, 
the preparation that goes up to it, I mean, when you arrive nine days before a race, it automatically feels special because the amount that goes into it each day before the race even starts. It's amazing. And just remind any of my listeners or viewers who don't know the team you're driving with and who, who are your teammates this year? So the team is the number four car, the Bike Collars car, uh, LMP1 category. And I've got Tom Dillman, a uh, Formula E driver for Neo, um, previous driver in uh, quite a few championships up to Formula 2. Um, and then a guy called Paolo Robertini. And ooh, he ooh. has yeah, it's very special. He has been driving a um, very good GT career, so he's got many wins um, from Daytona to, um, I think, Petit Le Mans, um, Sebring, and he's done Le Mans many times, but all in GT cars. How many times is it now? What, what number of Le Mans? Um, five. Five. Okay. Does yeah. it wear off a bit? I was going to say maybe it feels less special, but does it? Um I mean, the first time is obviously is, is obviously the most special. That was crazy for me because I'd never even been to watch Le Mans, um, and I'd driven I'd driven in the support series for Formula One at Monaco, and I'd driven uh, the support series Indy Five Hundred with Indy Lights. So I'd done those two, and I thought, well, oh, Le Mans, how much better can it really be? And then, uh, and so then you better. get there, and it, yeah, <laughs> you get there, and it's like, oh wow, um, and kind of the same experience that a lot of the guys like Hulkenberg and Button and. Stoffel van Dorn and Alonso, the similar thing that they've had the first time they came in. Oh, okay, wow, it really is. Yeah, exactly. I, cra- cra- crazy. Well, look, the, the Wi Fi is starting to play up a little bit, so I'm going to grab you for the main reason I wanted to speak to you. Of course, awesome to hear about your preparations for Le Mans, but. I have been nerding out about the whole Vettel Lewis Hamilton debacle that was the Canadian Grand Prix. I have no idea if you even had a chance to watch it, given everything that you're building up to yourself. Um, but have you caught up to speed? And if so, what are your thoughts on the whole situation? Yeah, I managed to to watch it after we came back from the track, and um, yeah, the rest needed a little bit of, of action towards the end. But uh, yeah. I think my opinion is the same as what 99% of people's opinions, or I hope 99% of racing fans' opinions are, which is that, I mean, there's just nothing Sebastian could have done. Well, it's not like he made a mistake, ran off straight, like, for instance, Grosjean did at Barcelona four or five times, and then came back on and pushed him into the wall and said, no, you're not coming past. Fair enough. But when you're sliding over the grass at 100 plus mile an hour and then and then you slide back on and he's literally, when you pause it and freeze frame it, it's still opposite lock until the second he's straight and there's still a car width for Lewis. Um, yes, Lewis had to slam on the brakes. Um, Lewis did nothing wrong. Uh, yes, he wants the extra points. Uh, if anything, him pulling Sebastian up onto the podium I thought was fantastic, even though you could just... For the people with really good hearing could hear Sebastian actually asking him to do that when he walked upstairs he said do the right thing let me up there no way um, oh I missed that completely that and not people caught that and I had a few whatsapp groups with friends and they were like no way and they repeated it so when he walked up he said to him he said you know what the right thing is to do let me stand up there um, oh, wow insight yeah. film. I love it <laughs> <laughs> and yeah so he moved not only the car positions but then um yeah, I think the more even, and more Sebastian cooled down, the, the less and less he was willing to actually stand up there by himself. So he stood up for a little bit and then came back down. Can I ask, though, I, I want to put you in almost sort of the other shoes, because I think everyone's been on Vettel's side, sort of trying to argue what he should or shouldn't have done. But what about Lewis? So in that moment, if you're a racing driver and a competitor in front of you that you're chasing down makes a mistake and sort of comes back on track and causes you to slam on the brakes. Do you want the stewards to get involved? Are you going to kick up a fuss to try and get a penalty? Or are you just going to, should he have just got on with it? Just stayed quiet and got on with it? Um, I think that the, it's, it's a really hard one because because the, that, that raw racing driver instinct that all fans, teams and drivers want to have in themselves is to win at, at any cost. Um, uh, and especially Senna, who everyone admires the most, and that is win at any cost. So Hamilton did complain on the radio straight away, but he didn't know the scenario in which he came off and how much opposite lock he had when he came back on, and he's recently said since he saw that that he would do the same thing. Um, that being said, I, I, I think that most drivers would still complain, and, and although the stewards getting involved is nothing they would want to happen to them. It's quite a selfish sport in that sense, that if that was the championship finale, the difference between first finishing first or second in the championship, he would definitely get the stewards to complain and probably appeal it and do as much as he can to try and win the championship. And if he wins the championship from Vettel by five points, then he's done the right thing to complain. 
It's a very hard one, and I think I can I can only imagine uh, in the heat of a race you're going to act with adrenaline and and the heat of the moment, and then step back later and review it. But as a pure fan, it took away what could have been ten or fifteen laps of great racing between arguably two of the greatest drivers on the grid. And so I guess you're a fan as well. You're a driver, of course. Yeah. But you love racing. How do you see in F1's and sort of new age? I mean, is this something that they need to be really careful of? Or is this in every category? It's just the fact that it was F1 that it's been made so sort of, you know, in the media and such a big deal of. Um, I think it's every category and F1's highlighted that. And that's fine. That, that, that is how it gets highlighted. What's not fine is, is, is the reason behind it. So th- this has certainly been um, a point of, of con- most controversy recently because there's been a lot of penalties handed out left, right and centre. But this one, I think, was was uh, the fact that they didn't choose to review it when they have the option to post-race and apply a penalty that cannot be changed. So even if they appeal it and they get some money back or this or that, they can never get first place. They won't be given first place back. That will never come back. So it is, I think, uh, a bad sign. Well, before we lose our Wi-Fi signal again, I'm going to keep all my fingers crossed that something similar doesn't happen to you at Le Mans and that you guys have a strong, reliable race. I'll be keeping all my fingers crossed, trying to tune in from wherever we are in the world. Oh, they're back in the 600 LT in. Can you hear it? Are you sure you don't miss yours? Yeah. <laughs> You're going to be gutted now. Uh, but yeah, look, Ollie, thank you so much for taking the time out and what I know is a super busy week for you. Uh, I really appreciate it. And it's been awesome hearing your insight and your opinion on the the whole F1 thing, but also your preparations for Le Mans. And uh, I just want you to beat Alonso. That's all I really want. Can you just do that? Or at least like, yeah, that would be mega. But if you take him off, then also you'll be in the papers. So like, then I'll be like, oh, let my mates in the papers. So <laughs> That's true. I'll just straight line into turn one. Please. That'd be perfect. <laughs> Mate, best of luck. I'm sure we'll catch up soon. But thank you again. I really appreciate you uh, taking the time. Uh, thank you. Good to speak best. to you. Well, there we have it. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, Ollie's such a nice guy. Uh, Awesome that he took the time to have a chat. Uh, Please do, as I say, let me know your thoughts on the interview style... well, interview. Yeah, the phone-in style interview. There we go. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, if you're watching here on YouTube, make sure to hit subscribe and turn on notifications. Give this video a thumbs up if you've enjoyed it. And if you're listening, please, please, please go and give Behind the Glass a five-star rating and leave a comment as to why you're enjoying it, uh, you know, what parts you like, which, which are your favourite episodes. Uh, it will help the podcast get discovered. Anyway, I will catch up with you next time when Vicky may or may not have returned. Um, uh, and we may also have another guest. Who knows?